You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 54. Today I'll be doing a special year-end wrap-up with Andrew Hosner. Alright, so my name is Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. Art Affairs is my attempt at shining a spotlight on the many wonderful people that make up this amazing art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, telling their stories. You can dig through previous episodes, complete with show notes, at artaffairspodcast.com, but the best way to stay plugged in is to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're really enjoying the show and want to help support what I'm doing here in an even bigger way, check out the Art Affairs Patreon. Not only does it give you an opportunity to help keep the show going, but there are several community-oriented benefits as well, like getting early access to episodes and suggesting questions for upcoming guests. You can find all the information about that at patreon.com slash artaffairs. You can also connect with the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. All right, so we've made it to the end of another year. Go us. And this episode is a special 2021 wrap-up edition of Art Affairs. I'm happy to have Andrew Hosner from ThinkSpace back on the show, and my hope is that we'll continue to do these at the end of every year to sort of cap things off. We talk about the launch of ThinkSpace's new gallery space, we dive into some of the notable shows that they've hosted this year, what they have lined up for the new year, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy this special year in chat with Andrew Hosner. Andrew, welcome back, man. It's really good to have you on again. No, thank you, my friend. Good to be back. And so we are recording this on Christmas Eve of all days, and which also is a few days after your birthday, so happy birthday again. Thank you. Thank you. And when we talked around this time last year, uh, you were just about to have the big launch of your new gallery space, and you'd, you'd already done sort of a soft opening with you know the last shows in December, but we're just about to have a proper kind of grand opening group show with the Aloha Mr. Hand. So I wanted to start there and, and check in and see how did things go with the gallery move and, and the launch of the new space. Uh, yeah, we, we, we've definitely settled in now. We've got a, a year under our belt there, and uh Oddly enough, it feels like this last show that we just did, uh, for Pez and Adore, um, was uh, the first one that we felt was really kind of felt like an opening opening. Um, and we had a couple hundred people through. I mean, we had a bar back, which was like a couple days before LA shut down again for the Omicron nonsense. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Don't care. Uh, I'm so over it. Um, and, uh, it felt really good. Um, we've definitely been doing our thing all year, but I mean, it's been a much more, I think anyone that's been going out to art shows knows what I'm talking about. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a subdued vibe. Um, mm-hmm. overall, it's just not, uh, it's still not, uh, rock into what we know it can do and, uh, kind of makes us a little, uh, I don't know, nostalgic. I guess you could say, like thinking back though, ah, oh, remember when we used to have three, 400 people for just a small opening and, yeah. you know, cl- close to a thousand for a big one. And it's like, ah, oh, one of these days. So, I mean, we, we, it, you can feel it crawling back, but, you know, evidently uh, COVID continues to fight back and, you know, three steps forward, two steps back, it seems like for the past year. So you're seeing a like a big difference in just vibe. It's just it's just not. I mean, a big part of that is, you know, there's no bar, you know, which obviously helps add to the festivities and, you know, helps people stay around a little bit longer so you can have a drink and talk and stuff. Because, I mean, just you, you just I think it's a lot more of a concerted uh, concerted is the wrong word, but just um true true art lovers you know are the only ones really coming out because you're just you know you're spending in la you're going to spend at least an hour round trip to go just about anywhere and if you're just going to go see a show and spend 15 20 minutes walking around to see the show and then you're kind of like oh well you know and if there's not really a crowd there's not a vibe you know i mean it's just one of those things so it's 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 a weird it's a just a, a different a different vibe a different you know it's it's hard to put a finger on it's it's been um a lot more about just uh quality conversations and hanging out and chatting, you know, the one we've probably only had artists out for about a third of the year. So that's definitely adds to it too, because that's one of the big draws. A lot of times is for people to come out, meet the artists, you know, get their picture with the artist, and, you know, maybe get a quick sketch or a 
you know, autograph card or whatever. So, I mean, it's a lot of, and a lot of the shows have been with international artists that haven't, you know, not for, not for not wanting to, for Christ's sakes, it's just, they just haven't been able to, um, due to the, uh, due to COVID and whatnot. So, um, but no, I mean, we've been rocking it. We've been, uh, had a great year overall. I mean, we had some of our biggest shows to date, oddly enough, um, you know, in terms of sales, in terms of exposure, in terms of notoriety and stuff. It's just, um, for a lot of those, unfortunately, the artists weren't really here to, you know, soak it all in. So it's just kind of, uh, I guess, bittersweet in a way, just because a lot of the shows you do wish that people, um, have been able to see them. And, you know, but with that said, like we were talking about last year, um, we have been, you know, we've upped everything in terms of our, uh, you know, how much we're sharing online. So, I mean, they're still in argument, like we were kind of saying last year, being seen by, you know, probably, five to tenfold what they used to be in person. But, um, you know, we can't wait to actually throw some parties again. We're hoping 2022 brings back art parties. Yeah. You know, where it's like, you know, elbow to elbow and we're enjoying it. And I know that kind of probably like brings cringes to a lot of people just saying that right, right. now. But I mean, <laughs> hopefully these jackasses that uh, seem to have, a, I don't know, an issue with helping others out. Uh, finally, uh, oh, they're never going to wake up. Who am I kidding? So let's just hope we figure out ways to work around it. You know, I'm all for, uh, I mean, the vaccine cards and all that stuff. It's tough, you know, because. Uh, yeah. What's that been like? Like what kind of precautions have you taken as far as like we tried it? One, we tried it one month and it was just it just seems like you're poking into people's business and, you, and we're, we're still asking people to keep their masks on. So what does it really change other than probably just. I don't know. And LA only really asked everyone to do it for like a month or two. And supposedly restaurants still have to do it, but we've gone out to eat a couple of times in the last few weeks with, you know, artists and other, other folks for around the holidays and, um, not been asked to show a, show a card anywhere. So, I mean, evidently they're saying that you have to, but so it's just, it, it's just weird. Um, it's just weird. I mean, we're just trying to keep ourselves and our staff safe and, you know, past that. I mean, we're not trying to be, you know, super militant about it, but at the same time, you kind of want to be to try to, you know, yeah, wake people up to just, I don't know. I don't think anyone wants to be wearing masks again throughout 2022, but right now I kind of feel we're going to be, and uh, at least for a good chunk of it, I say six, nine months of it. So, so are, are masks mandated at least, uh, you know, for guests that come in? Yeah. Yeah. We do do that just because okay. that's about, and you know, when we had the, the bar last month, I mean, most people were just doing the, the pull and sip vibe right, and some right, people right. had it off for a little bit and then would put it back on but i think by and large uh i mean i think it's going to go smooth as we continue to reintroduce things like that let's let's hope knock on wood yeah so are, are there still things that you want to do with that space or is it pretty much in the state that you wanted it to be in as kind of a final state uh this past september we made a few additional changes after we had lived with it for a minute i guess um just realizing a few things that i guess we could have did a little better more in terms of like the viewing room office area so we kind of changed one of the walls and knocked down a couple things in terms of uh the desk uh receptionist meeting area greeting area i don't really know what to call it and built a new one and now it feels like i guess the finish way as you could say is kind of perfect we've had a lot of comments on it so um we're pretty stoked with it um made a few more adjustments to the back warehouse and uh yeah i think all we need now is some more murals in the back area and then uh, I'll be a pretty happy man. But uh, no, overall, everything's good. And the area continues to kind of uh, come to life. A few more restaurants and a few other galleries have, uh, you know, started construction, just opened t- type five in the last year. So um, and you can see it all kind of come into life. Um, meanwhile, like some other galleries really uh, in like the West Adams district continue to kind of make moves and get bigger and bigger as well to bring more attention to the area like band devices and some others so it's uh it's going to be a good little area over the next uh next uh, few years as it continues to grow and come to life and uh we're excited awesome yeah and i I noticed you picked up a couple new staff members at least uh, you know as far as i know you know halo pig daniel and cody jimenez did was that more of a formal kind of adding them to the roster because i know daniel's been working with you for a long time yeah, Daniel's been, you know, I, I mean, I think we called him our secret agent or something like that for the longest <laughs> time. I think we need to update that on the website. But um, he's now, you know, just going to be, I mean, he's leading the charge on um, NFTs and going to start um, handling things in the Discord world for us and just being my right-hand man um, at the end of the day and just helping me kind of uh, 
branch out and do a couple of the other things that I've wanted to do. Um, he knows most of the artists already, so that's great. So, I mean, somebody that I can, uh, you know, fully, fully trust in terms of just, uh, you know, hanging out with people, doing things, going out on the scene, representing Think Space. I mean, we uh, didn't do Miami this past year just due to COVID and the fact that we had a really massive show with uh, opening the same week um, at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art with Eber Brantley. So, Halo had went down to uh, Miami and, uh, you know, was kind of flying the flag and, you know, still, you know, making sure Think Space was represented and hanging out and whatnot. So it was nice to, uh, it's nice to have him on board fully. And um, going into the next year, he's going to be full time. Um, last couple months, we've just been kind of figuring things out, getting him, getting his feet wet. Um, at the same time, he's also been transitioning out of, you know, his old industry and his old job and, you know, figuring out what he's wanted to do and make sure that what I think I had planned for him, what we had planned for him felt good. And uh, now we're excited um, to kick things up a notch going into the next year with him. And uh, Cody's come on board and um, is working uh, part time, but uh, probably come summertime once he makes the move closer to L.A., he'll definitely be working a, a good bit more with us. But um, he's in our warehouse and uh, he's become uh, a big part of the fam. He's awesome. And he's also uh, quite the amazing artist to uh, keep an eye on as well for uh, folks listening. Check him out. Awesome. Yeah. So, what motivated that growth? Was it just you know filling gaps that you felt you needed in the? Oh, it's just yeah. It's just it's uh, just totally uh, like just needed. We probably need one more person right now. We're just trying to figure out what, who, and what that exactly will be. But we're I think gonna let the uh, things develop a little bit more on what uh, Halo Pig's doing first, and then uh, go from there. But uh, no, I mean uh, we've just become, you know, things just continue to grow. So we want to make sure that we uh, have the best back and we can to support the artists that uh, we work to, uh, you know, build and grow. Awesome. So, so I, I took note, I went through the, the last year of shows and kind of took note of some of the ones that I, that stood out to me for one reason or another. So I kind of want to go through some of those and, and pick your brain on, on how some of those went down. Um, so early on in the year, you know, I guess it was around the February time frame, around the same time that I had him on as, as a guest on the podcast, you curated a show in New York for Dulk, working with uh, Spoke Art for their New York City location. Um, and, and I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, you've, you've done shows with Ken before, right? In, in the, the San Francisco spot? Yeah, and um, we did one, I think, in the New York spot before. Christ, I'd have to... Memory fades. <laughs> You'd have to ask Ken. <laughs> um, we've done at least, gosh, five or six shows to, five or six shows together over the years. And that one was just Dulk wanting to rock a show in New York and me knowing there were, you know, I think Ken talked about it a little bit on his recent episode uh, with uh, Juxtapose that he did um, with their uh, podcast that, uh, you know, I mean, one of the main reasons he opened up in New York was just a lot of the uh, old connects that were there for a lot of the artists that we work with had slowly been closing or going out of business. And he realized that if he didn't do something, you know, something was going to develop that probably none of us wanted to happen. So uh, we were kind of stoked when he did open the spot out there because it did give us a nice little uh, outlet probably if uh, needed for some of uh, the artists that we both, you know, share a, and then B, you know, artists that we work with that don't have a New York spot, you know, gave us a trusted ally to, to work with. And when the Dulk show, you know, when Dulk's desire to do a show in New York came about, we looked at doing a fair, but you know, he really wanted it to be able to be seen by more people and um such which as i say that is kind of uh ironic considering at the end of the day no one saw the damn thing uh <laughs> in person uh, due to covid but uh we decided to go forward with it um just because you know he, he has a, he had a very busy year and didn't want to uh you know push it back and in retrospect had we pushed it back i don't think it would have changed the darn thing since we'd still be looking at pushing it back and we're almost i mean a full year later uh which is really kind of crazy but at the end of the day um he delivered an incredible show and um the, the staff there did a great job uh you know representing it and also debuted his uh line of uh like jewelry that he did with the the company that he's working with out of spain and overall it was just um you know a positive experience just one of those just a big bummer overall that he couldn't you know support it with a mural in the city and do some things that uh you know i think everyone just wishes they could do with like their big new york <laughs> debut debut but um <clears throat> we still uh you know 
we still went live and did a bunch of stuff like that on Instagram and did a nice video to her and tons of tons of uh photos and whatnot and had a nice print drop in tandem with it. Overall, you know, did everything we could to do normally. The show sold out, went great for him, you know, sold his big sculpture and everything. So I think I mean, I think no regrets other than just, you know, me not being able to be there and him not being able to be there. Um, we did just see each other like literally like two weeks ago because he's been in the States. I saw that he was in town. Yeah. What is he in town for? Uh, I guess I'm not letting too much out of the bag. Sometime in 23, like s- late spring, summer, we're still uh, ironing out the exact dates. He's going to do a pretty incredible show. His next show in L.A., um, his first um, show at our new space which he's really excited about since he's taken advantage of the, uh, the, the, the size of the space and is really going to do some of his biggest works to date and has some really cool installation ideas. But he's, um, this was the first trip of, I believe three where, um, this, this trip was kind of focused on the West coast. He'll do another one that's kind of focused on the Midwest and another that's focused on the East coast going into the South, but he's basically doing a tour and trying to spend a couple of days at, um, all of the U.S.'s national parks oh, wow. to gain inspiration and photo reference and kind of bring light to all of the national parks since uh, the government doesn't really seem to be on the side of the national parks too much of late, yeah. not to mention um, the environment and um, our wildlife in general. So we've got some really cool plans to where um, most of the works will be based on endangered species out of each of the parks we're then going to be doing a series of prints and other things and probably show catalogs and exhibition information, pamphlets and stuff like that, that really bring a lot of light and information um, being shared um, to the art world and to his, to his fans um, to kind of just sh- show what they can do um, to help the parks and to help uh, the environment and the wildlife will be doing some stuff with born free um usa an organization that we've worked with for over a decade now um in tandem with the show and we'll be doing a series of prints that are kind of each related to a certain park and a certain amount of the proceeds from each print will then go to that park um that are raised from the print like the show will take place and then all of this will continue to kind of be its own little uh I guess the universe for the next, you know, probably three to six months following the show. So we can continue to like, you know, really make it a nice little, uh, I don't know, kind of landing spot to, uh, to learn and, you know, hopefully, uh, spread the word from there. Um, I think we might do a special site for, it, or at least an extension of our site. Um, all things that are being worked out that it might honestly probably just become a discord, which probably makes more sense in this day and age. Um, but just, um, very early on as we get it all, mapped and ironed out um definitely be a, like a figure in tandem with it too that's awesome and some other stuff but we're excited about it because um i mean and he's also making me a little jealous because he's already done and seen a lot of stuff in just the past couple couple weeks that i haven't and i actually grew up in this fucking country so uh i'm mean, kind of like he's, <laughs> i think he's motivating my wife and i to get out there and see some stuff and uh you know that's amazing but um no i mean um and it's amazing because he's also got his um firstborn son uh sarah and him have brought tono along and um he he's already becoming like so much of a a little dude already and it kind of blows my mind because i look at what i was at that age and i'm like this is a drooling moron <laughs> this kid's like already seen like probably four or five states three four countries you know this and other thing it's i mean he's gonna have an amazing upbringing so uh gonna be cool to kind of watch him grow over the coming years yeah mini doke no, that's really cool because I mean the the uh, the the national park theme. It reminds me of last year when you had a, a show with Scott Listfield that I think originated originally. It was it was it was supposed to be around the national parks, right? Yeah, that was the vibe that he was going for too. So it is kind of funny to um, to do something like that. And we're uh, slowly starting to talk about doing something with antler again that we definitely want to have fully tied in with Born Free since they're so nature centric already, um, and we haven't done our like an endangered species show in the last few years and uh already had it on my list that we needed to make it happen but our program at the gallery is a little full so when um when neil hit us up to uh come back and you know for the the notion of doing another show with them uh 
definitely got a, we're, we're still talking about it and still getting things sorted out, but I definitely want to have born free involved with that again, too, just because, um, it's not like things are getting any better out there, um, on that front. So, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So in March, um, you had a very interesting, or you were involved in a very interesting show with the, um, the memory, uh, let's see, persistence of memory Dolly show at the Muckenthaler cultural center, which I, I, that stood out to me because it was kind of like one of these things is not like the other. It's, it's not (laughs) part of, part of the, you know, the new contemporary movement, but I also know that you are very passionate about Dolly. And that was how I think it was our first episode. You talked about it. That was one of the things that got you excited about art originally. Oh yeah. He was my, my gateway. Yeah. Um, so it, it seemed to make, it made sense to me, but I guess talk a little bit about what your involvement was with that show and, and how'd you, how you got involved. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, um, Dolly was definitely the gateway that I mean, the first artist, um, that really kind of, you know, made me go, Oh, there's something, something to this art world. And, um, you know, having many framed prints from him and Mucha, up in my apartment when my uh now wife came over to visit me for the first time was one of the things that i think uh made her realize i wasn't just a dirty metal head and I, don't, you know, <laughs> I think she was expecting a bunch of slayer and beer mirrors around my apartment and, and i had like properly framed uh prints up and you know the set and the other thing in plants and she was like oh <laughs> <laughs> wow but um but no i mean um that show came about um due to our relationship with um uh, Kelly Chittister, who is the, uh, she, well, no longer, but she used to be the uh, director and curator over at the Fullerton Museum Center, who went through uh, a number of changes, unfortunately, during COVID, and she moved on to another institution that uh, we'll be working with very soon, but uh don't want to let that out of the box just yet because it's a little premature. But um, she, uh, through her you know job at the Fullerton Museum Center, uh, was asked to uh, help with this exhibition that was coming to life over at the Muckenthaler, um, which is another uh, cultural institution there in Fullerton, which is uh, the Orange County area of Los Angeles. And um, really, really beautiful um, place, like almost in its own little park. And they were putting together a show, and due to COVID, a lot of the loans that they had um, set up just went belly up. Um, they were getting a lot of uh, original dollies and some prints and some things that just, you know, weren't going to happen. So they kind of hit her up going, you know, like almost a Hail Mary a few months out from the show going, you know, do you know anyone that's, you know, dolly inspired, dolly esque that, you know, would be willing to come on board and, you know, at the same time, you know, help us, you know, spin this PR a little bit. And they were able to put together um, a really pretty, you know, I think considering that maybe only 2% of the people that probably went to the exhibition knew um, that that happened, uh, it was a really great exhibition. I mean, we visited a couple times and um, took some folks out to it. And most of the artists, I believe, that we uh, put in it had a chance to get out there and check it out. Um, it was open for limited uh, visibility, um, limited visitation, I should say. And, um, no, it was a, it came together to be a really cool show. Um, we had Spencer Little go out and install one of his, you know, large scale seven foot sculptures that added a nice little touch to the show. Um, and overall, I, I was just excited to be a part of it. I think a lot of the artists were too, because I mean, it was a really beautiful space and, you know, it's a nice little, uh, look on your CV down the line. And, uh, overall it was a really cool show. And, you know, there was a couple a couple of originals, lots of uh, early, you know, signed prints, and um, nice. yeah, it was it was neat. You know, it was one of those like unexpected uh, cherries that pop up throughout the year, you know. So, do you think you'll you'll try to do more of those kind of shows that features old, like combining old masters with with the new contemporary movement in some way? We've got a really amazing show cooking um, that was supposed to happen this year, and then due to COVID, it's been pushed back, and now we're just waiting for the museum to kind of sit down and plot their 2324 program which i'm told is supposed to be happening um probably anytime in january um but uh i don't want to let too much out of the bag but there's something really cook really cool cooking because it's one of those ideas that the museum's even kind of like not even mentioned it to too many people and i've only mentioned it i've only mentioned it to like two people that you know like my wife and uh my partner lc i've mentioned anybody else because i'm afraid anybody else might just mention it mention it. <laughs> it it's such a fucking good idea that's awesome though. that's exciting to hear that's something's cool is coming yeah yeah and the museum's so excited about it that they're already talking to a couple of their 
partner museums and other markets about the notion of, you know, like, hey, would you be into, you know, taking this on after it comes to us and doing an iteration of it, you know, with your space? Oh. Um, so hopefully. So my tour. Yeah. Yeah. So it, the idea of it will tour. And I guess once the cat's out of the bag, that'll make more sense. But um, yeah, so it's, it's a pretty cool show that uh, I'm super excited about that'll have a exhibition catalog in tandem with it to help you know preserve everything and whatnot for the ages so um or we're we're super super excited at that so um yeah there's there's definitely something else cooking so. awesome that's very cool so kind of next up in the timeline we saw the return of powwow um, which was really cool to see with the first decade show in hawaii uh obviously as you've done for several years you helped to curate that the exhibition portion of that um, that all opened up in May and included artists from, you know, around the world and, and as well as local artists, which is always, you know, Powwow's MO. How much were you able to, how much time were you able to spend out there? I know you had a show right opening right around the same time. So how much time were you actually able to spend out in Hawaii? No, I mean, thanks to the, the team that we've got in place and, you know, just, I think just the fact that it was COVID times too. So I guess the demands back here weren't as, as great. Um, we were able to make it all happen pretty nicely. Um, I missed like the first few days of installation, which I think I'll probably regret to the, my, my dying days, just cause that's like when everyone was really, you know, going off and doing a lot of the, uh, install aspects of their, uh, their murals and whatnot. But, um, everyone was still going when I got there and, um, the amount of work that was in, uh, the show, um, that we curated in the back end, And then there's much stuff that was going to life and coming to life uh in the front end um it's still kind of a marvel that it came came together as strong as it did because i mean we only had like a couple of people from the museum there because their staff was just splintered and uh skeleton crew due to due to covid and going into it um i mean that, that was supposed to take place like september of the year prior and then i think it got bumped to december and then february and then finally may to where then we were like if we don't do it now guys it's not yeah, gonna it's happen off. just yeah it's off because at that point it's not the 10 year window anymore <clears throat> they had too much stuff already pushed back to where we were going to have to go back in like another two years if we did it anymore and uh i mean up until like probably a month before it i mean we were still changing things just because mm. like you know you're hoping this this uh certain mandates in certain countries were going to lift in time to where you know you could have these artists that you hoped to have come uh come since there was um you know hopes to have a bunch more uh international folks in the mix than there uh at the end of the day there was but um all in all i mean the show came together in ways that uh i'm still kind of baffled that the museum uh allowed <laughs> <laughs> i mean uh there was there, there there was many things that just kept, would get brought up on the daily by them or jasper i mean by jasper or i or um you know one of the other uh one of the other uh, folks bringing it to life and the museum just never said no. Um, it was really pretty incredible. Um, what they allowed, um, what surfaces were painted on that I just never thought would be allowed to be painted on. Um, it was pretty wild. And the opening went off really amazing. I have to say, um, considering the limitations that we had, um, placed on us, but, uh, I don't think uh, anyone felt it. It was, um, and considering how much of a bubble, especially at that time, Hawaii was, I mean, like no one was getting on that island unless you had a litany of tests and whatnot. Because, I mean, you had to go to certain doctors and certain testing sites before, like two days before your flight. And oh, wow. I mean, I, I saw one in four people on my flight getting turned away because they didn't. I mean, you really, I mean, Jasper walked everyone. It was through it. Like you guys have to go through this with a needle and make sure that you do everything. Wow. And a lot of people went to testing sites, but they weren't Hawaii approved, which was like maybe 10% of the testing sites. And you just had to double check the website, but a lot of people just didn't do that. Um, and it was funny, man. I mean, I can't tell you, I mean, there was three or four people in the mix of powwow that, you know, had to go home, do it. And really? Come back. Yeah. Just people that didn't, yeah, yeah didn't listen to Jasper, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize Hawaii was doing that, that, that sort of travel restriction. Yeah. And they're, 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 they're con they've continued to be pretty tight through all this. And that's why the transmission right there is so darn low. Um, kind of like the whole New Zealand, Australia vibe that are, uh, you know, nice little models to look at that we don't seem to learn from. We don't follow. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but anyways, not to dwell, not to dwell on that bullshit. So with the murals all being indoors there at the Bishop Museum, how, how much did you see that changing the way people approach their pieces? Um, I mean, it, it definitely, I think, made for a much nicer experience since, you know, I mean, yes and no, it, it was different because I think there's something special for, you know, exploring and finding them and, you know, enjoying the great outdoors of wonderful Hawaii, yeah. but at the same time having them all in one contained space and, you know, air conditioning and, you know, no worries of the tropical, you know, storm and whatnot that happens almost daily there um, with little bursts. I don't know. It was, uh, it was different. I think locally it put powwow in a light that was like tenfold uh, different for them. I mean, the amount of, you almost have to be like have grown up on the island to understand it, but like, like, like for example, um, Woes was in the show. His mom was basically like, you've made it. You can't get any bigger. You're in the bishop, you know, because she grew up on that island. Going, growing up, that was where you went as a kid, you know, on your field trip. And that was the island on, or excuse me, the museum on that island. I mean, it's an absolutely historical, beautiful place that looks like it's grabbed out of the middle of London or something and plopped on the island. It's just absolutely amazing. I mean, and there's full blown like whales and everything hanging, you know, from the ceiling in the, in, in the, in the natural history part of it. I mean, it's a legit, like as legit as you can get. And the wing that we were in is where the, you know, the traveling exhibitions happen and stuff like that. And where over the years, the, uh, walking with dinosaurs exhibition always happens. So it's a, it's a pretty, you know, major place. So, and you know, his mom's eyes, she was like, well, you, there's no up from yeah. here, <laughs> you know, I mean, and it was just the cutest, most amazing thing to see. And we've all grown up seeing, you know, her love of, you know, her son and stuff. Cause she's always out at all the powwows. Um, and you know, it just, it's, he, he's got a pretty amazing family. So just seeing that, like really put it into perspective for a lot of us in terms of like what it means there, what it meant for powwow in terms of stature and in terms of just respect locally, since over the years, they've always kind of had to fight for just about everything. And I, now I think that is like a really big feather in their cap. Um, that's going to allow them to, uh, to branch out and actually, um, it's not going to be this February, unfortunately, just due to you know COVID kind of surging again everywhere. So they're um, looking at we're looking at doing it like June, July, August area. It's still getting worked out. Um, it's going to be in a new section of Hawaii. Um, it's going to be focusing on um, a school of uh, in the, in another area of the uh, of the island, um, and uh, it's going to be pretty special. Jasper's got a lot of things planned for it. Um, as well as Kamea and Jeff and the whole team, Amy and everybody. Um, they just want to take it in a little bit more of a direction to help, um, you know, I wouldn't say at risk, I hate that term, but just, uh, you know, kids that are, you know, that need help, that need a little bit of extra love, that need a little bit of extra attention, um, inner city type stuff, and, um, and just bring the arts to them and bring the arts to their campus. And it's a really... Uh, large campus um that's similar to something actually uh, worn from branded arts that we work with a lot here in los angeles has done with a couple of campuses here where um a lot of these bigger inner city schools are just you know have just massive massive walls that are just gray monoliths so almost kind of like depression i think for a kid that's you know there you know walking in amongst them going from class to class so Jasper's going to be Jasper's going to come in much like Warren did and um you know add some color add some inspiration and at the same time bring some uh you know I think some uh, art education along with the walls and you know have the kids meet and talk to the artists during the creation process and stuff like that and you know hopefully open their eyes up to the you know being an artist that's as amazing. a possibility so um as a livelihood and such so um no we're excited to see how that that comes about and stuff but um that show was uh i think one of the biggest draws the museum has had in uh a long long time which honestly seems to be the case wherever we take uh one of those type shows with powwow just because it's it's new it's fresh you know museums don't generally you know let artwork get created on their walls let alone you know feature artwork that's you know in 
of such an ephemeral nature. That, yeah, you uh, said the same thing about the 2015 Long Beach show that that was yeah, like the you, biggest if, thing yeah, that they had. Yeah, if you if you don't go to it, you're gonna miss it. You know, I mean, right. we're, we're uh, so um, no, I mean, that's uh, doing shows like that is really it's really special. That's awesome, and it's really cool that 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 powwow as an organization is using the stature that they've gained from that to benefit underprivileged children and and help them kind of understand what opportunities they have in the arts. I think that's amazing. No, Jasper and uh, Amy, um, they've got two young girls and Jasper works really closely with a lot of the schools. Actually, um, I know he's uh, doing some courses at one of them and I can't remember which one right now. And I hate that I can't. He He's always been very driven to uh, make sure that he's heavily involved. I mean, even the last you know 10 years in Kaka'ako, there was always um, components and programs, you know, geared towards kids. Um, there was always, you know, a big soccer night or something like that where a lot of the kids came through there's always a b-boy battle you know that has all levels of ages and you know and he's always got a you know community wall for the kids each year and stuff like that so i mean it's uh no, it's, it's it's we're uh we're pretty blessed to be working with those with that crew yeah it's awesome so in july you had a pretty interesting show with the real life is fragile show that was uh co-curated by ken wajugbu which is also a, a former guest of the show um featuring several artists based out of i guess western africa notably uh nigeria and cameroon um you hosted ken's show earlier like a few months earlier um his solo show so did that that group show sort of spin out of that earlier solo exhibition or the idea of it, or was it completely independent of his show? No, that exhibition was very, uh, very motivated and, uh, inspired by, um, the interactions that developed and the relationships that, uh, formed from doing that first show with Ken and, um, meeting the large click of the artists that he works with to support. Um, since he's got a whole little kind of uh, crew that, work to support and uplift one another and um as things really took off for his show because that show did very well for him and uh got him a nice little feature in juxtapose and got a lot of press online and it was just a really well received show we just continue to get like inundated with incredible talent that just was not on my radar prior and um due to some issues with our schedule we had like a little we had like an extra week built in if i remember correctly yeah we had an extra week built in that we usually give everybody like a week off in in the, in the summer just to kind of regroup and i jokingly said to my crew well that's what we've been doing for the last six months i'm gonna use <laughs> i'm gonna use this week to do something a little special and um you know just because we didn't really have a hole in our program um at all it, that year at all in 2021 and um didn't really have many in 2022 and um there were so many artists that we were talking to that were just hungry and we're also just sheerly i mean just just incredible um in terms of their skill so i just you know was chatting with ken and i was just like hey man i'm like if we cover shipping since i know this is a big ask you know for someone you know to, to ship a bunch of stuff over for just a week-long show but if we you know do it right and we you know create a virtual tour of it it can live online for three months um you know we can do a bunch of you know videos of setting the other thing and make sure that everyone's represented and gets a full bio and so i mean we kind of went about it from the, the notion of we wanted to help everybody you know get showcased as much as we could but not you know but realize that you know it was a big ask and we also i think you know, started putting together the show like maybe a month and a half or so before. So we really had to hustle in terms of getting the works over and getting everything organized and, and such. But um, at the end of the day, everything came, came together wonderfully. Um, we had 10 artists, like you said, coming in from uh, uh, the Western Africa region and everyone was able to put in anywhere from two to four pieces each. And the exhibition was just was super, super well received um since i mean i'd say probably 80 85 percent of the works have sold over the last um number of months we're starting to you know ship some of the works back that have uh not sold um and i think at the end of the day it really helped a lot of the uh artists involved uh get a you know a whole lot new attention and uh you know build their uh 
international profile quite a bit. And of the 10 artists that were featured in the show, we've continued to work pretty heavily with three or four of them and have uh, bigger shows with two of them next year. Um, nice. and, and Ken will be back next year as well. Um, not, not counting Ken and that next. So yeah, there'll be three counting Ken and then Ken will be back in the main gallery in 2023. Um, next year's just going to be like a smaller show in the viewing room, just with some works on paper and a few things just to keep people's, uh, you know, keep people on, you know, excited and, you know, looking forward to it. And at the same time, the last show didn't really have any smaller work. So we want to put out a batch of smaller works, help build the, build and strengthen his patron base a little bit more here. And then in 23, he'll come back and do the, the main gallery again with a larger show. But at that point, he'll then curate gallery two with um, a piece or two each um, on the smaller side from a lot of the artists that he's continuing to work with. Um, oh, that's awesome. That are, that, that are part of his crew and stuff like that. So we're excited and looking forward to that. So um, so it'll be a joint show with, with his solo show in the main gallery, in, in the gallery number one, and a curated show by him in gallery two? Yes. That's awesome. That's really yeah, cool. So I'm looking forward to that. And Ken's a Ken's a great guy, so it's a honor for us to be working with him. So awesome! It's I didn't realize that show came together in like a month and a half. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, and all over DM. It was it was pretty wild, man. Just That's me and amazing. Ken just doing like Ken doing intros over DM. Like, hey, this is Andrew, you know, and just and you know, I mean, and just you know, automatically, I think kind of giving the artist that trust factor. Since at that time, um, there was a number of you know, gallers from around the world kind of uh, exploring that uh, region, trying to, uh, you know, get their programming a little bit more woke, which ours always has been. But it's been uh, it's been interesting to watch the uh, the arc over the last year for a lot of folks that, uh, you know, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I'm not going to harp on it, but it has been interesting. Oh, that's awesome. So um, in September, you had uh, Kayla's latest solo show, Kayla Mahaffey. Uh, and if I recall correctly, that entire show, which consisted of some pretty large pieces, uh, sold out before it even opened, right? Am, am, I, am I remembering that correctly? Did you guys sell out uh, on, before opening night? Yeah, a couple a couple days before, it, it, we, we had sold everything. And um, when, when we... Uh, when we made the move to the space and uh, we shared with all the artists coming up, um, I remember Kayla telling me how excited she was because she, she knew she was going to go big. You know, she wanted to like, you know, she had this vision in her mind of this show where everything was large. And I think a lot of the, our patrons were hoping for a, a large show, but a, a large show of 20 to 30 pieces that were, you know, I guess more, more approachable for most people's homes. It wasn't a price point thing at all. It was just, I mean, they were, they were big. I think the smallest piece in the show was three by three feet. And that, there was only one of those. And then there was like one three by four and then there was four by fours and five by fives. And then just on up um, a couple six by eight footers, um, just a tour de force. That was one of those shows that I think for the rest of her career will be looked back upon um, as like the one that really put her on the map. And I can't tell you how honored and just proud of her. We are um, honored to have hosted it and proud of uh, her for having delivered in such a strong, strong, strong fashion. And um, just how confident she was of just every aspect of her decision-making for the show and how heavy the works were in terms of what was in each of them. And I think for a lot of people, um, it was eye opening, uh, tales because each piece really had a, a really in depth, strong story to it. And, um, we went out of our way to make sure that that story was heard by as many people as possible, um, for her. And, um, no, it's just, um, definitely one of the, I think my top five shows that we've ever put on for, for sure. If not top three, just cause and I'm just so proud of it. So proud of her. So, um, and, and it just, it was, it really made the, the gallery just shine in, in, in such a way. And I know that there were so many eyes on it and she had her first like big eight page feature in juxtapose that we were able to help, um, lock in that came out right around the show and stuff. It was just a perfect storm. Um, there's an exhibition catalog at print right now that's, uh, g- gonna help, uh, I guess, uh, lock it in for the ages, which is nice and, uh, came together really nicely. So, so I know that we've talked about, um, 
in previous episodes how you will often develop for certain artists you'll often develop a multi-year kind of growth plan to help them and you you even kind of alluded to this with what you were talking about with with ken where you want to do a smaller show and then a bigger show like you'll develop a multi-year strategy with an artist that spans the course of of multiple years and it seems like you might have done this uh, and having not talked to you about it, it seems like you might have done this sort of thing with Kayla because you had her show earlier and then this big show and it's, each one's kind of building on the next. Was that sort of the relationship that that you've built with Kayla in, in, in that multi-year kind of plan? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And we're, we're about halfway through it. I mean, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the plan was like the smaller show going into to then the the little mini solo in Miami into, you know, the the, the mini museum show that we did with Moa and, you know, and, then, you know, at the same time getting her into the, the mural world more of power, which she's already done a few of. And then, um, knowing that this show was going to be a really big marquee show. And then the plan was to, uh, go to Hong Kong this spring, but with COVID that's not looking like it's going to happen. So we're, I think we're probably pivoting to, uh, that'll probably happen in 23. And uh, we've got a museum show in the Netherlands um, that's going to be taking place um, with her and uh, another artist in the summer of 2022 uh, that we're looking forward to um, that she'll be uh, doing a mural in tandem with as well, which will be neat. And um, some really cool plans are coming together for 23, 24 that I don't want to let out of the bag just yet. But there's a lot happening in like the exhibition catalogs. Uh, currently at print, we're definitely going to do a larger monograph, um, but that's more like 23, 24. And then um, her first bronze is currently uh, in production oh, wow. that we've uh, produced. And uh, that'll be coming out like in February-ish um, that we're really excited about. It's absolutely amazing. Um, it's based on one of the paintings from her uh, first solo with us. And uh, then uh, there's also a... Uh, polystone figure like a proper figure um that's uh 12 inches tall 30 30 centimeters that'll uh be coming out uh in the spring too so um she's got a, she's got a, 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 a some amazing projects cooking and she just did the big miami city bike project this past december that's up through the spring down in down in miami that happened in tandem with uh art basil and just did a big mural for winwood walls yeah, um, yeah i saw that which we were uh i mean that's just huge for her it's just um, all things that are just part of building her stature, building her profile, building her uh, persona as uh, one of the most important artists over time. That's amazing. And it's really cool to see. And I remember around the, the time that her show was opening, um, or maybe it was just after that, that you had tweeted something about how another gallery had reached out to her trying to throw shade at you, telling her that you were doing all these things wrong, effectively trying to poach her for their own program, despite you having just show, like sold her entire show out. So I'm not really interested in calling yeah, out anybody here. World 101. But it's, I, <laughs> I mean, it, it is a pretty like pitiful thing to do, but I'm curious, is that something that, that you deal with a lot? Do you have other galleries that are whispering in the ears of people um, that you've had success with? Constantly. Yeah? constantly yeah i don't even know that's the only word i can think of but constantly yeah i mean yeah i mean we lost a couple of lost a couple of our bigger artists this past year mm -hmm. due to bullshit like that and uh, it's not even worth getting into because it means just part of the part of the ebb and the flow um and you know the first five years it used to just first five years it used to be like someone was taking a kidney from me you know because i mean and you know arguably looking back you know we didn't have a whole lot of you know bargaining power for them to stay around it was just more like love and want and desire whereas now i feel like you know we've done you know pretty good due diligence on you know proving to, to folks that you know we work as hard if not harder than just about anybody out there and we can offer just about as much as anybody out there but sometimes you know the allure of showing next to people that i guess you look up to as an art star um is you know the one thing that we can't compete with sometimes because some artists will, you know, or some galleries have rosters that are obviously a little larger than ours in terms of that perception of art star. Mm. So if all of a sudden you can be at an art fair alongside a, B and C artists that you look up to. And then also with the way the art world works, all of a sudden you're ABC and now you're D 
you know, you've now grown into that perception as well, since you're showing now alongside them at the same gallery. It's hard to argue it sometimes, you know, and ultimately at the end of the day, we will always be the gallery that, you know, from an art historical perspective, from their bio perspective, this, that, other thing, from anyone that's paying attention, doesn't have their head up, you know, firmly up their ass that was following things, you know, will go, oh, well, you were always the guys that, you know, did their first big show or did their, you know, or did that show, the show, you know, whatever that show may have been, fourth show, fifth show, sixth show, whatever, that just popped, you know, and, ah, you know, I mean, there's certain collectors that get it. I mean, uh, Lee Gotio, um, a crew of uh, four collectors that's on Instagram. I'm really tight with those guys. And, you know, one of them just tweeted the other day, like, you know, because uh, we, we talk about it a lot. And they just tweeted like a random tweet on their story that I saw at least 10 other collectors share, which made me feel good because at least people see it. But it's just like, you know, hey, artists, you know, remember those that helped get you where you're at, that made you, that made you shiny enough to be on the radar of this new person. And maybe, you know, not cut off the legs of the person that helped lift you up. You know, it's like you don't have to close the door completely. Right. You know, but 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 a lot of these galleries that come in and do this do that. So it's obvious. Oh, no, I shouldn't say it's obvious. So it is perceived, especially after a year or two of them then taking over said artist, that they found that artist. That there's never that there's never any look or connection ever again with the gallery that put them on the map you know and then over the course of you know two three four years oh my god i can't believe these guys discovered this artist and it's like no fuck you wouldn't even have cared about them if you know we didn't help develop them and most importantly and this is what it always is get them to a certain price point you know, and these larger galleries will always use their bullshit story of, oh, well, we got a bigger overhead, so we have to have people at a certain price point, this, that, and other thing. But it's like you can always do it how we've done it for the last 15 years of working with established artists and also emerging artists and balancing out your program to where there's a nice ebb and flow and one supports the other. Yeah. But there's certain people that just want money, and that's all they give a fuck about. And, um, you know, that's 90% of the New York art world for sure. Um, I mean, that is just driven by money and that's why, you know, so many of the dealers out there now all of a sudden have, you know, little crypto punks and apes as their, you know, avatars. Cause it's just like, right. that's all they're, I mean, they care about, you know, and I mean, there's something to be said, there's something there in the NFT world, but I mean, the, the daily updates of so-and-so just bought a crypto punk <laughs> for 2.3 million and this, that, and another thing. It's just like they bought it cause it's an investment. I mean, it's not because they thought the crypto punk was great art. Um, but, but I mean, but with that said, it's all part of it, you know, and that's a whole nexus. That's a whole nother talk. Um, and it's, it's developing at such a rapid pace, um, that I think it's anyone's guess, um, how big it's going to get. Um, it's not going away. Um, we've only scratched the surface of what NFTs can do and what you can attach to them and what they can open up and what they can unlock and, not to mention the metaverse and stuff like of that nature. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be an interesting time. I mean, I can't, it, I mean, to me, it feels exactly like when, you know, everyone was like, you know, laughing about, you know, everything going digital in the music world and stuff. And, oh, that's not going to happen. And this, that, and the other thing. And every one of us in the music world, you know, cause I was heavily in, entrenched at that point in the sales side of things, you know, could tell that it was going to, uh, you know, take over quickly, you know, so um it's interesting um i mean and i think it's it's gonna be very similar um in the art world you know there's definitely gonna be a whole click of you know 30 and unders that you know are, are all in and you know a lot of the art they have will probably be replaced by screens in their in their cribs and there's a l large group of 30 and overs that you know love the tactile and want to have the you know the physical and um it's it's going to be interesting to see how museums you know respond to it miami this past december was you know definitely eye-opening and telling to see uh you know even places like basel proper you know having a you know an nft room and you know everyone's very alert and awake to it um personally i'm, I'm like i'm on the razor's edge so to speak um but from a but from someone that's you know represents and works with a you know a large family of artists we're you know we're very uh, alert and have been watching it very closely and you know that's why uh 
we wanted to be sure that Halo came on and could help give it the, you know, the attention it deserves and stuff like that. And um, Heidi Johnson, who works at Hijinx PR, who is our uh, publicist, um, she's been, you know, heavily entrenched in that world for the past year, working on a number of uh, bigger projects and, um, you know, been watching and talking with her on the, on the weekly about things. And um, no, so, I mean, we're, we're to the point now where we're, uh, yeah, getting it going. Yeah. I don't want to share too much. It'll be all revealed soon enough. Fair enough. So uh, if we go to December, so just a few weeks ago, um, you curated a show with another former guest, Hebrew Brantley, you mentioned it earlier, his, his Saints and Shepherds show at the Fort Wayne Museum. Um, so, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. How did, how did you, is that the first time showing Hebrew and how did that show ultimately come together? Uh, it came together just through our friendship of, uh, seeing each other over the years at different powwows. Um, and always kind of wanting to work with him, but at the same time, knowing that he's not really worked with many galleries in the past. Um, so we've always kind of had this like joke that, you know, get me a museum show type thing. And, um, as our relationships grew and I think as I, you know, checked off the ones that I wanted to get off right away with the artists that we do work closely with, I then kind of started to look at, um, as the relationships grew, you know, and as time passed, I started looking at some shows that I guess I kind of had on my, uh, my wish list of artists that were like, you know, that I've got good relationships with from a collector or just personal standpoint that, you know, are definitely down to do something, but they, they want something bigger. So, um, you know, Hebrew was on my short list of about three folks. And, um, a couple of years ago, Joseph, uh, Zimmerman and I started talking, um, and I started sharing with him a couple of the names from my wish list. And I was like, Hey, you know, these are, uh, you know, a few artists that I would absolutely love to do something with, you know, that are a little outside of our normal wheelhouse that, you know, we don't normally do shows with, but you know, I've got an in, so to speak, I can make this happen. And, um, Hebrew was one that, uh, you know, immediately kind of, uh, I think perked up his interest being that they're there in the Midwest Hebrew, you know, born and raised in Chicago and, um, how important of an artist he is and how much I think he's lacking institutional support, um, that I think a lot more is going to be coming his way over the next five to 10 years. And we wanted to, uh, you know, help hopefully start to, uh, you know, turn momentum in that favor, I guess, with the show. And uh, once I kind of had some dates from Joseph, I uh, asked Hebrew if I could have a meeting with him and his crew and uh, went over and uh, met with his team and him and uh, discussed it. And we came together uh, with a, a pretty pretty special show of, uh, you know, new works mixed with uh, some from his archive. And um, yeah, I'm a, it's a big feather in our cap and I'm super honored to have been able to give him a that platform and we were also able to get the show uh previewed in the actual uh print copy of uh, juxtapose which is his first, which was also his first time being in juxtapose which is kind of mind-blowing even listening listening to that come off my lips that's crazy yeah. um so uh i know he was really excited by that as well and um no nah, he was able to come out for the opening and uh made a lot of people's days because it wasn't really super well attended opening just due to COVID and COVID restrictions and everything like that. But the people that were there were, you know, had life changing moments with them, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty special. And I think he was really excited and uh, stoked to be able to attend. And uh, no, it was a, it was a, it was a special little weekend for sure. Yeah. You mentioned that, that he hasn't um, worked with a lot of galleries and that came up in my conversation with him. And I think we were talking about just his business acumen in general and, and how he, he's so good on the business side of things. And it seemed like it was very clear to me that he's had some bad experiences in the past that have kind of soured his opinion of yeah. galleries. And, and he was he was very pointed in that criticism of galleries needing to earn their there and you you and I've talked about this several times on the show is galleries in today's world in social media galleries really need to earn their their percentage um yeah. and he's not had those types of experiences so how how do you i guess what do you say to an artist who's like him has had a bad experience with a gallery in the past how do you restore their faith in in the power of what you do you just got to do it by pr- showing them you know i mean actions speak louder than words everyone can say they're going to get you the stars and the moon and then deliver a cup of coffee you know i mean it's just uh, it's just actions speak louder than words i mean we work really hard 
and try to do the best we can to maintain the relationships that we build. And, um, I mean, with folks like yourself, I mean, the fact that you continue to have me back on to Yaddle and discuss and, you know, share our love of art and whatnot, uh, means a lot, you know? And I mean, that then, you know, branches off and you end up, you know, talking to two or three or four, you know, of our artists throughout the year. So, I mean, it's just, and sometimes it's, you know, it needs to be pointed out, you know, but I mean, like we, we, we do a lot of advertising, we do a lot of marketing and, you know, sometimes, you know, somebody will, you know, get some press and I'll always kind of like share it with them and be like, Oh, Hey, you know, just so you know, and, and it's always, you know, I'm like, this definitely came about through our, you know, little nod, little nudge, little, you know, a little poke, so to speak. And, you know, little money never hurts, but you know, you never want to take downplay the fact that, the love came, you know, but at the same time, it, it doesn't hurt to have someone that's, you know, on your side going, Hey, look over here. Cause especially when you think about how many art shows are opening every week in every city around the world, repeat every week, you know, just over and over again. So the fact that you're getting love on a juxtapose.com or getting asked to talk on art affairs or getting love on beautiful bizarre or high fructose or, you know, supersonic or, you know, just any of the sites out there that, artist gets stoked to get on i mean you're ultimately largely getting on there due to the support and love of the people that you know work hard to to support you you know if if they're doing their if they're doing things right you know so yeah it seems like a like an uphill battle i mean just just having these people that are souring your name you know that that you have no control over like (laughs) just just other galleries just you know setting a bad example, I guess, is, is it's got to be frustrating. Oh, no, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, or, or, you know, we'll work with somebody, you know, some of the younger, you know, upcoming artists that we work with, you know, really strongly the first couple of years. And then all of a sudden they start, you know, they, I guess, let's say they get their footing and they start getting a name for themselves and they'll start branching out. Um, it's always interesting to, you know, kind of have that talk with them a year or two and, you know, branching out and just hearing the, the war stories or, you know, there's a few artists that have, you know, thought greener pastures existed. And, you know, we, we had civil partings and after a year or two at, uh, other venues, they kind of came back and were like, Hey, it sucks out here. And we're like, and we're like, I, you know, don't want to say, I told you so, but you know, <laughs> glad, you, glad, glad you, you know, learned that I wasn't bullshitting and like, you know, embellishing and that you know that is yeah that's the case a lot of the times and sure come on back you know and we've you know gone on to do some great shows together i mean i can think of a couple instances um of recent memory but uh no i mean sometimes it's just that's what has to happen you know because i mean i think everyone likes to think that you know maybe there's better out there but i mean more often than not i mean uh there's not unfortunately um and I think I've said, I think we talked about it before. At the end of the day, there's not a whole lot you have to do to be cool with folks, you know? But I mean, it's surprising to me how often I think at least it's not as been as often as in the past. I think maybe just because COVID uh, actually uh, did a little purging too um, <laughs> in terms of the greater art world, in terms of galleries that, you know, couldn't make it and stuff like that. But uh, you, you just got to work hard to, to, to matter you know i mean it's just too t- too darn easy for artists to sell out of their dms you know these days and get everything but if you're able to to be that person that provides that bridge to the platforms we were just talking about to the press outlets we were just talking about if you're able to you know hustle and do your due diligence and at the same time you know open doors at institutional levels and you know provide cool things you know like the dolly show that popped up and just you know just other random things then you know, the collaborative shows with other galleries and, you know, doing art fairs and actually spending money to show that we're trying to, you know, do everything we possibly humanly can to, you know, to be worthy of that 50%. Then, then, you know, but unfortunately, like you said, there's just, I think for every, for every good gallery, there's two or three bad ones, you know, I, I think, you know, I mean, if you just look at the sheer number of galleries out there and the no, the number of ones that actually matter or mean something the math kind of speaks for itself um it's just but you know at the same time i think to get to that spot to where 
one of the good galleries wants to work with you, you got to go, unfortunately, you know, kind of go through that minefield. And mm. like, like you said, Hebrew went through the minefield and he just said, fuck it. You know, he figured out that he could do it on his own. You know, he was able to, he was able to get enough traction during that time to where, you know, he put together a great team and he realized he didn't need to, you know, and it was pretty obvious outside looking in that he, you know, wasn't going to do a show with us just out of, as in terms of like a regular show. So that's why, you know, I went about making sure that we could get him something special. So no, that's awesome. It's a really cool show. Um, so we've talked a lot about the last year, so let's talk about what you have coming up. Um, you know, I think by the time this show comes out, um, your, tw- your first 2022 shows will probably already be underway. So, so tell me about those first, I guess. Um, I think you have I'm on boy, Stom 500, uh, a couple others. Tell me about those first set of shows. Yeah, no, it's for sure. Um, we're excited. Uh, we've got a pretty, uh, pretty kick-ass roster uh, program in place for uh, 2022. And um, a couple things even that are kind of still on the ether that uh, if they come about will be uh, even cooler. But um, kicking off 2022 will be um, uh, the West Coast debut solo since he's done a couple, uh, or he's done a solo, I think I should say, in the uh, Midwest with Vertical in, in the past, which was on the smaller side. But this will be his largest solo to date in the States and West Coast debut from I'm on Boy. Uh, a graffiti artist from uh, Malaga, Spain, and uh, the show's called No Regrets. Excited for it. It's got a variety of uh, canvases and works on paper um, from him alongside uh, Stom 500, who's from France, who we've been uh, working with for the past uh, year or so, just like I'm on. Been introducing both of them through group shows and you know small showings in the uh, viewing room and just kind of getting their work out there into the ether. And... Um, Stom actually will be able to become will be coming over. Unfortunately, I'm on can't, um, but hopefully he'll be doing a, a mural or uh, hopefully a mural in town. We're, we're we're actually getting it all worked out right now, and then um, we'll be debuting some uh, new works in the viewing room from uh, Chigozi Obi, uh, who was actually in the Real Life Is Fragile show that I mentioned earlier, and she actually has a bigger show coming up uh, at the end of the year in September. So this is just uh, like three or four new works just to kind of continue to uh, wet the whistle of our uh, patrons and continue to just uh, help expose her works and such. And we'll also be uh, debuting a new artist um, that we're working with um, later in the year and also uh, much, much more. We've uh, got like a like a five year plan in place with her of uh, like a progression of shows um, artists out of Philadelphia that goes by Z the Rat. And um, she's absolutely in- incredible. Um, I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am for uh, people to see her work. She's, LC uh, was saying, like, she's this, like, perfect mix of, like, folk and contemporary. I, I, I'm super excited by her work. Um, we'll be talking about her a lot more in the year ahead. And then um, February, we've got a group show of uh, four local artists that we're excited to uh, bring together um under the uh, title intersections um it's bringing together alvaro nadeo uh manuel zamudio uh sean bannister and gustavo romada actually i should add that uh manuel is from texas my bad so three nice. local artists and, and manuel <laughs> and we'll also be debuting um the la uh, debut solo and i believe her first solo overall from uh, andrea aragon um somos magica um that's all be in gallery two and um we, we came across, I guess, discovered her work um, in terms of us discovering her work. She uh, worked in the accounting department at Fine Art Solutions, which is one of the uh, framing companies that we work with here in L.A. And uh, the owner of the company was giving me a little tour the first time that I went out to see them. And uh, her work was on the wall of his office. And uh, he saw me continue to eye it as uh, he was chatting with me about various, you know, things that they could offer, various services. And he's like, you like that work, don't you? And I'm like, yeah, man, I can't keep my eyes off it. I'm like, who is that? And he's like, oh, she works here. And I'm like, get the fuck out of Dodge. <laughs> and um, after the meeting, uh, he went and introduced me to her. And she was like, oh, my God, I fucking love Think Space. So, you know, I'm big fans That's of awesome. Res Bros and some other artists you work with, you know. I'm like, well, what's your Instagram? And I uh, gave her a follow that day. And um, we chatted over the next couple of weeks on DM. And, um, yeah, led to her being in a couple of group shows this past year and then this this will be her uh, her big solo debut, so we're uh, excited for that. And um, we'll also have a new grip of work from uh, in the viewing room from Marie-Claude Marquez, 
um, new little collection of plates, um, uh, like the her lettering, her her, her <laughs> obscenity laden, beautiful work on plates. Um, we're looking forward to that. Um, she's always a very popular with our uh, with our patrons and stuff. And then in March, um, we've got one of our bigger. Um, shows of the year, I think, with um, pairing of Victoria Casanova and Langston Alston in the main gallery, each with solo shows, um, who will be both back in 23 with bigger solo shows. But um, this, this is kind of like a nice little introductory, get their feet wet and um, get folks talking. But um so excited for both of their shows. They are just have incredible bodies of work that they're about to unleash. And in the project room, we'll, uh, in the gallery too, We'll have uh, Young Ji Cha, who we've uh, been introducing over the last couple of years in group shows. That'll be her first uh, solo show that we're really excited by. And then um, in the viewing room, we'll have uh, new works from Mia, the creator, um, a.k.a. Jemiah Colvin from uh, Chicago. Also, uh, William Hofnagel from uh, Netherlands with his first mini solo show with us. And uh, he's got bigger shows coming up in 23 as well to follow this up. April, I mean, just looking down the line, we've got Casey Weldon coming up with uh, his his first big solo at the new space. And uh, Dovey Golden from Chicago will be uh, in Gallery 2. And that's the month that uh, Ken Wadabu will be uh, in the viewing room. And then May, we're looking at uh, Sandra Chevrier coming back, which we're super mm, excited to have nice. Sandra back. And uh, that'll also be, uh, and also in May, we're doing a big uh, museum exhibition, the debut U.S. Uh, solo museum exhibition from Super A, uh, Stefan Thelen from the Netherlands. That'll be taking place at the Museum of Art and History out in Lancaster. Um, super looking forward to that. He's got some really cool plans for that. Um, June, we're going to have uh, Scott Lisfield uh, back for his uh, next show, first in the big new space. Um, week after that, we head over to Dubai. Um, which we're super excited for. We've got a group show over there called Unity that we're, uh, we've curated with 20 of our top artists that will be taking place at uh, Valeri Gallery, um, which is ran by uh, Rom Levin, who does Street Art News. Um, Rom and I were um, curators um, that helped build the Urban Nation Museum back in mm. like four or five years ago over in yeah. Berlin. Um, and we've kept in touch and uh, always knew we would do something again. So it was kind of cool when I saw him uh, open the space um, just before, uh, I think just before COVID, actually. Um, uh, it was <laughs> when, when everything started to come into life for Valeri for him because he's been living over in Dubai for the last number of years and did a really big uh, mural project just before COVID hit. And then that built and led to this. And um, the space is absolutely beautiful. And for the first year, his whole notion with the uh, space was to have other curators curate it, nice. which is, um, you know, a nice way for him to kind of uh, work with everybody that he's worked with in tandem over the last five to 10 years on other projects. And at the same time, I think a clever way to put Get on a gallery on the map yeah. right away. Yeah, yeah, because you've got, <laughs> you know, each month you've got another gallery hype in your gallery. And at the same yeah. time, it gives you, gives you access to a lot of artists that you probably wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So, I mean, uh, and it's a beautiful space and an important new art market. And um, he's, by and large, selling most of the works into Dubai proper. So it's not like the works are just going on tour and then, you know, selling all over the place, but nothing selling there, which can often happen in, I guess, exotic locale type shows. But um, no, so we're really looking forward to that. So that's going to be in June. And then in July, we'll have the debut U.S. solo show of... Uh, Ryle Lexamana, Ryle, as he's more commonly known, which I think is going to be a massive show. Um, August, we'll have the Perez Bros um, at the L.A. spot. And then also over in um, Amsterdam, we'll be doing a show at the Strat in Amsterdam, which is a beautiful museum there. And that'll be a two-person show with Kayla Mahaffey and Carlos Ramirez called uh, Shared Experiences. Excited for that show. And then September, uh Nice little lineup back here in the gallery, um, four-person show. Um, doing a show at the Mesa Contemporary Museum that month, too, with Georgico um, and Reen Barrera. Brand Library and Arts Center show will be kicking that month. A um, couple art fairs at the end of the year. Um, yeah, Brian Rivera's big return solo show. I mean, that's just a... It's a big year. 2022 is going to be packed, not to mention, you know, a couple bronze editions coming out. Four, four or five books planned, three or four figures. It's a huge year. Um, 
numerous prints. Yeah, so we've got a, a lot coming, the launch of our NFT program. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, not slowing down anytime soon. <laughs> not at all, man. That's awesome. Yeah, you have an incredible year. I uh, Yeah, I look forward to seeing how that all develops and, and how, you know, like you said at the very beginning, um, how the vibe continues to evolve as people get more comfortable going to live events, you know? No, let's let's hope that continues. <laughs> let's hope that continues. <laughs> I mean, if it doesn't, we're, we're you know we're ready to pivot again if we have to. But um, I think everyone's kind of just uh, I mean, it goes without saying that everybody is over it. But um, we can't wait to welcome them all back. I mean, <clears throat> I, the brewery next door to us continues to get busier and busier too. But then you know at the same time they're not you know like started to go into evening hours because that's not really a thing yet i mean i see people you know people are going out in the daytime but still the evening's becoming mm. it's still you know i don't know it's just uh i'm sure it's all going to continue to to morph and change as we go but uh let's hope we get through the holidays without another big wave since there's so many people traveling right now well if, if you've if you've shown anything you've you've been very good at being able to adjust on a dime. So I, I, I feel pretty confident that whatever happens, you're going to be able to deal with it. <laughs> so. No, thanks, man. Thanks. And like I said, there's even a couple other nuggets that, uh, you know, that are like waiting to be picked, I guess you could say for next year that we're just waiting for the, you know, final pieces to fall into the fall into place. And, and then, you know, a couple other contacts that have moved on to new, uh, new, new, uh, new institutions that, uh, you know, they're starting to crack open the door for me there. So those relationships are starting to build. So we'll definitely, uh, once the foot's in the door, kick it open and make sure that we put something together for each of the spots. So Awesome. Very cool. So as we kind of close out, remind folks where they can find you online if they don't already know. <laughs> no, no, but we're at thinkspaceprojects.com um, for, the, uh, for the old school website for those of you that still have a uh, do that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we're on, uh, you know, you can find us on... Uh, numerous uh, podcasts out there if you want to hear a little bit more about our history and what's coming up um thanks to good folks like michael and other than that uh we're on twitter and instagram and facebook and uh our discord launches pretty quick and uh yeah i think other than that i mean uh you can find us in los angeles in the west adams district if you're in town come on by visit us open tuesday through saturday from 12 to 6 Awesome. Very cool. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for doing the show again, man. It's it's really great to have a chance to, you know, sit down, reflect on the last year and, and catch up with you like this. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for taking me down uh, memory lane. You always, uh, <laughs> it's always nice because sometimes uh, we're moving so quick. We don't really, really uh, look back and uh, take a moment to reflect. So yeah, yeah it's always, always, it's nice to do these for sure. So that's it for this special year-end wrap-up. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Andrew. It's always fun catching up with Andrew and, and having a chance to, to look back over the past year and, and reflect on, on all of the interesting events that happened. Think Space had another killer program this year. And in spite of all the negativity with you know COVID continuing to affect people's ability to you know, gather comfortably in large numbers, they still really knocked it out of the park with all of their shows. And it's also been great to see how they've begun to make use of their new gallery space and going into the new year as you know hopefully the vibe continues to trend upward and you know we all start venturing out again and 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 getting together more safely it'll be nice to see that old opening night excitement uh, make a return and, and continue to grow and their program for 2022 is shaping up to be pretty awesome i've already had a couple of the people on who they'll be showing in in the coming year like ken and scott but then there are also a few on the lineup that I'm hoping to get on the podcast for the first time in 2022. So definitely keep an eye out for that. I'll try to line those up so that the podcast episode um, coincides with their respective gallery openings, uh, you know, as best I can. So thanks again to Andrew for joining me today. And thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. And just a reminder, one big way you could help out if you're really enjoying the show would be to check out the show's Patreon. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash artifairs. And as always, you can contact me through my website at artifairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artifairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other.